Welcome everyone to today's presentation of All Electric Homes, um, brought to you by 3C RAN and Inbalance Green Consulting. My name is Michelle Zimney and I'm a Senior Sustainability Coordinator Consultant at Inbalance and I'll be your moderator tonight. We're going to be joined by Itzel Torres from 3C RAN to give us a little information about the organization. Um, before we do that, I do want to introduce our speakers briefly. Mike Horgan is a certified passive house designer as well as a licensed contractor in California. And Jennifer Rennick is a um, licensed architect as well as a certified energy analyst. And they'll be our guides today for today's program, All Electric Homes 101. I will be uh, largely in the background monitoring just how things are going. If you have questions, please do feel free to enter them in the chat. To get to the chat, if you're not familiar with it, put your cursor along the bottom of the screen and you'll see a chat button. If you click it, it'll pop up and you can send questions and I'll be monitoring the chat room. Um, please do keep yourselves um, muted as I know we all probably have lives going on in the background and it helps to keep that muted um, for the presentation time. But if I do call on you, feel free to unmute and um, ask your question live. We will be reserving some time at the end of the program for questions. If something seems really urgent and relevant to the moment, I may execute my moderator privilege and interrupt our speakers um, to bring the question to them directly. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Itzel Torres from 3C RAN to tell you a little bit about their organization and their programming. Go ahead, Itzel. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really, really appreciate it. So just going to dive in a little bit about to talk a little bit about what 3C RAN is for new people to our network. So 3C RAN is a Tri-County Regional Energy Network, which is a collaboration, a partnership between Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Ventura counties, in which our mission is to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free energy efficiency programs and services for all building professionals and households. 3C RAN is funded by ratepayer dollars that we all pay into our utility bills through the public goods charge. Um, next slide, please. We currently have three programs. The first one is our Energy Code Connect um, program, then our building performance training and home energy savings. Next slide, please. For Energy Code Connect, um, ECC serves building professionals, um, offers services for everyone from plans examiners and inspectors to architects and contractors, both residential and non-residential. We offer three distinctive services, Energy Code Connect, at Energy Code Coach, which is an a phone online over the counter and in field service that provides Title 24 consultation for, for building professionals trainings and regional forums. Next slide, please. For our building performance training program, it serves prospective building professionals and we offer trainings in tech that provide expert instruction in technical skills related to building science principles and systems for high performance buildings, soft skills trainings. Um, and today's training is under, under this, this program. Next slide, please. For our home energy savings program, um, we offer free and discounted home upgrades. Our multifamily program has been launched, which offers technical assistance at no cost and rebates up to $750. Um, for more information about this program, you could check out our 3C Ren um, website. And our single family um, program is soon to be launched. So more information on that coming soon. But currently we do also have our DYI home energy saving tools kits that are offered in at our county libraries in the region. So it's a good opportunity for, for people to get a little bit in, into what you could do to electrify your home a little bit better. I could drop some information about that as well in the chat. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I'll hand it back off to the Imbalance team. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Itzel. And uh, with that, I see Mike and Jen are both ready. Mike, why don't you uh, start us off? Sure, and I'll probably start off by, uh, I'm one of the people who probably has to apologize because there's two kids and a puppy um, right next to me and at my feet. So if there's background noise, you know, <laughs> we're all doing the best we can with what we have. Um, thanks, Michelle and Itzel. Um, Jennifer and I, uh, love teaching these workshops. Um, I can't see all the people that are in the workshop. I can only see our three faces, but I did see a couple uh, names that I know. I see Kevin Halber and I see Chies in the workshop, which is awesome um, because maybe she can talk to us about her passive house uh, retrofit that she did up in, I think the San Jose area. Uh, so I'm Mike Horgan. I'm a builder in, in California. Uh, I was licensed in Massachusetts and California. I just maintained the California license. Um, PHI certified. I've done PHI and FIAS certifications. Those acronyms might not make sense to people, but it doesn't really matter either. Um, Jennifer is a licensed working architect and certified energy analyst. We work together. Uh, we're working on projects together uh, daily. So um, when we do these in person, we're able to see people's faces and see who you are. Uh, I'm gonna, Jennifer, I'll take your question here and ask if people want to, if they can, um, put what their background is in the chat. If they are, um, I just saw Kevin's face. If you're a realtor, if you are a homeowner, uh, if you're a builder, if you're an architect, if you can just put that in the chat for us so we have an idea uh, what your backgrounds are, that would be great. And in person, we can see your faces and your reactions and we can judge uh, whether we should stop or not and answer a question in, uh, in real time. We can't do that now, but we do like to have a conversational format. So if there are questions that you have as we're moving through, uh, please you know, raise your hand, put it in the chat and Michelle will monitor it. And um, she's quick to stop us before we get too far down a rabbit hole of something to answer a question uh, that pertains to a current slide. Um, this is a very broad brushstroke of all electric homes. Uh, we are not diving into any one aspect of things. We have an entire workshop uh, dedicated to almost every slide that we're gonna go through here. We do a full workshop on heat pumps for heating and cooling. We do a full workshop on heat pumps for hot water. Uh, we do a full workshop on retrofits and remodels. Um, so we are doing a broad brush stroke here. Uh, why all electric and how that can help us have a lower carbon footprint. Um, some of the, the mainstays of all electric homes, um, the mainstays of fossil fuel free homes, I've found that that terminology um, has worked better with clients. Uh, sometimes all electric gives this, the, the connotation of the 70s all electric homes, which by all accounts were terrible, great idea, really bad execution, uh, but fossil fuel free homes is, is what we're talking about. Um, heat pumps will be you know, a big key to that, but they're pretty standard nowadays. Cooking without gas is um, not so standard and seems to be a, a big roadblock. We're gonna try to help you get past that roadblock and how all of this you know, within a system leads to uh, lower energy use in your buildings. Um, so why all electric, why a lower carbon footprint? Uh, so we'll go over some of the benefits, um, how you can do it, um, some of the big scale benefits, some of the little benefits, health, uh, economics, we'll touch on a little bit. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna give you a, a broad picture here of everything. Okay, this is where I'm gonna jump in and just gonna let everyone know, um, I see that we, I did, I did scan the chat. So it looks like we've got a great variety of folks, people that are sort of in the trades in this business who I'm assuming want to learn more, but also maybe uh, have a better idea of how to talk to their clients. And then I see we have a number of homeowners on the call who are interested in this. So in a way, this is kind of ideal because the homeowners, if there's some things that you don't understand, it's a new vocabulary, an acronym, something doesn't make sense, ask. Because you are teaching the rest of us who are in this business that these are the kinds of questions most people have. 
So it's super helpful for us. Um, if, if you guys do put stuff in the chat and ask us questions. Um, broadly speaking, if you're new to all of this, there is something called uh, Title 24, and it's a California state legislated set of rules that govern how we build buildings. And then one piece of that Title 24 has to do with the energy use in buildings. And our specialty um, overlaps a lot with the Title 24 that deals with the energy code. And that energy code in California says every building's got to have a baseline energy budget and new construction has to be better than this baseline energy budget. And for those of us who are in this business, it's good news to hear that there's an all electric, i.e. fossil fuel convenient option now within the energy code. Homeowner, you might be like, well, okay, wasn't that always true? No, it wasn't, just so you know. <laughs> the next piece to this kind of demand of why we're looking at fossil fuel or all electric buildings is PV panels or photovoltaic panels, panels that generate electricity from the sun are actually part of the new requirement for low rise, means just three stories or less residential new construction. So if you're gonna build a brand new house, for example, you would have to have some panels that generate electricity just as part of the code. California is doing that because California is moving our entire state to reduce carbon, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce dependence on foreign um, gas or outside resources for gas and fossil fuels. This all electric technology that we're going to talk about, it has been field tested, we call it. It's been used throughout the world and in our country. Um, I know from my experiences living in Europe for a portion of time, and that was, oh gosh, that was like over 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And this heat pumps that we're going to talk about were already everywhere. Same thing with Japan, same with China. And in our country, or rather in California, we transitioned off of coal and onto natural gas as a transition, and we got kind of stuck there. Now the state is saying, no, it's time to transition off of that and onto the all electric with the heat pump technology because it's very, very efficient. And we have lots of ways to generate electricity from the sun or from wind now. And along those lines, I think everything apart from a few photos that are in this presentation are all projects that we are, we've either worked on separately, Jennifer on her own or myself on my own, or are currently working towards together. So um, just about everything that you'll see here is uh, real things we're doing in the field currently. That's true. Um, these are the top, these are the top five questions that we get from our clients. And it doesn't, these questions come up no matter whether they're in the same line of work as us or not. But one of the questions, when you're talking to your clients or if you're a homeowner yourself, you might be wondering, well, what happens when the power goes out? And we have a lot of clients who believe that if they have gas appliances, if the power goes out, that they'll still be able to operate those appliances. Depends on the age. Most all of our appliances now have electronic starters, even if they use gas, which means when the power goes out, that more recently installed on-demand gas hot water heater, for example, will not work if you don't have electricity, even though you're connected to gas. So... Worrying about what happens when the power goes out isn't a reason to not have an all electric house, but you might want to consider a battery backup for resiliency as part of your package for how to make your house more resi resilient. Um, the cost for building, it turns out is not higher. And in some cases it's less to go all electric. 
And especially if you're in new construction, new development, and you're completely eliminating the gas infrastructure from the get-go. And, and Mike will talk a little bit more about that later. And then the cost to operate, it used to be that it was more expensive to use electricity. That's because you were talking mostly electric resistance and the cost of natural gas was quite low. Now, the cost of propane is up. The cost of natural gas is up and it's a little volatile. And the electric heat pumps are so much more efficient that they're basically on par right now, which is part of why California through its energy code can transition us to uh, all electric because they have done many studies to show that it's a cost effective option. And one thing you might want to kind of understand also is that a lot of your clients might realize that some of the electricity on our electrical grid is made through natural gas generator uh, power plants. And that's how we provide some of our electricity through the night when the sun isn't shining. And it's how we can um, power our grid through times where we don't have wind or solar or hydro feeding the grid. However, California as a whole is transitioning the grid to be less and less dependent on those gas peaker plants, they're called. But even so, we have enough clean energy feeding our grid that if you go all electric, you still are having a reduced carbon footprint, a reduced um, impact on the environment to transition to all electric if you're going with heat pump technology. And then probably the very, very last thing we hear about a lot uh, on our projects is we'll have clients who say, I get the idea on heat pumps. I get it. That's fine. That's great. We'll do heat pumps for the hot water, heat pumps for heating and cooling, um, better windows, better walls, all that. But I want my gas cooking. So Mike's going to show you some stuff to talk to your clients or, you know, maybe for you yourself interested in transitioning to induction. And we're not talking about the, you know, electric resistant coil type um, ranges that are not your cook's friend, but the high end induction units that professional chefs are using throughout California and across the country and in other countries as well. They're, they're really amazing. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mike, and Mike's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, heat pumps. Fun stuff, heat pumps. So uh, really, one of the one of the main um, talking points and main installations uh, that works in an all electric home. And again, this is a, this is a broad brush stroke. So we do we do an entire separate workshop just on heat pumps. Um, and then that gets divided into two separate sections for conditioning and for water. And we teach workshops on those entire different aspects. So here's a, a quick brush stroke, a little bit of history, um, why heat pumps have gotten a bad name. And there's probably people in this workshop who uh, might be concerned about installing heat pumps for various reasons. Uh, we'll talk about how they work, where we use them and the different types of systems that get used for uh, space conditioning and for water, especially so. Um, Here's the math and the science and the engineering that goes into thermodynamics and heat movement, um, conductivity, and really all we're talking about is a refrigerator. Um, we all use heat pumps every day. This is kind of an old hat analogy uh, for folks who are into the all electric world, into the fossil fuel free world. Every person in any room or conference that you've spoken at or been to is using a heat pump on a daily basis already. And they have been forever, for as long as any of us have been alive. So there, there really is no reason to have a, a bit of a bias against it from the get-go. Otherwise you'd be eating spoiled food and warm beer, uh, drinking warm beer every day. So this is, this is a heat pump. This is my refrigerator on my 30th birthday. Uh, 
back east filled with a ton of craft beer. And all it, a refrigerator is taking these warm cans and warm bottles of beer, and it's not making them cold. It's taking the heat coming off of those warm or room temperature bottles and moving that heat somewhere else. And so the bottles become colder. It's, it's pulling, pumping, pushing the heat away from the bottles. And in most cases out by your feet um, on the floor at the bottom of your refrigerator. That's a heat pump. So there are um, many myths that revolve around installing heat pumps in buildings. Uh, most of these myths, if not all, have been, dis have been dispelled a decade ago on the East Coast where these myths actually mattered. We're on the West Coast where these myths shouldn't come into play in really any way, shape or form, no matter what, but yet they're still prevalent. So the myth that heat pumps don't work in cold weather is just completely false. I built in coastal Mass on coastal Massachusetts on Cape Cod for 15 years before coming here. I mean, 150 feet from the ocean through the middle of the winter with our condensers covered in four feet of snow. We've never had a problem. Um, if you are in a cold environment, there are places in California it is colder. The, the, the outdoor condensers can have an added electric resistance heat strip put into them. So when the time calls, that kicks in and does go into effect. But in general, most of the places we're working, particularly on the central coast here, uh, that electric resistance strip, we don't even spec that into the condensers, we just remove it. Uh, the myth that they're hard to install, you can make things as easy as you want to and you can make things as difficult as you want to. There are heat pump systems that are very easy to install. And even the more difficult heat pump systems are, I think, generally easier to, to install than an FAU system because you can use a different type of force there. So uh, the ductless systems, which we'll um, dissect uh, a little bit further on, are super easy to install. The first time I did it, uh, our HVAC guy talked me into doing it in about 2007. And we started the morning and three hours later, he came around from the back of the house, clapping his hands and said, you're all set. And I was leaning against the truck in the street and had, I couldn't believe that it was done that quickly. Uh, but just that fast, we were conditioning a second story, uh, two bedrooms on the second story. Um, that they're noisy, they're not. They're a little bit louder than a refrigerator, but we've installed them and wall mounted them. Um, on the backs of walls with folks who have sleep issues and we've never heard a complaint. Can you hear it? Sure, if you go outside and you stand next to it, you can hear it. You'll say, well, something's, something's working, but it's not a distracting noise. I would liken it to um, every now and again, uh, we hear the, uh, the tenant on our property, we hear his Tesla start, but we have to really listen to hear that Tesla start as he leaves at four o'clock in the morning when the rest of the street is silent. Um, expensive? I don't think so. It depends on, um, again, you can buy a, you can buy a $20,000 car or you can buy a $200,000 car. So there are a lot of different systems and the expense and the cost can be driven by many things. A lot of which is the design of the building itself. Or if you're going to choose a ductless heat pump system or a ducted heat pump system, a ductless has a much lower labor cost. The ducted has a bit more uh, involvement on the labor side. So uh, I would say they are comparative, cost comparative or equal to a, a gas system. Um, so why they've gotten this bad rap, and, and I'm sure you'll hear it depending on which HVAC companies you might talk to. Um, the concept of heat pumps used for conditioning was a great idea back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, sure it was being used in military stuff before then, but when it came into the residential uh, markets or commercial markets, they were really just a, a giant fan that operated just at one speed and that speed was full tilt all the time. They, they weren't variable speeds like the ones today. So the way heat pumps work is air moves across a coil that contains refrigerant and that refrigerant absorbs heat and then moves that heat somewhere else. It absorbs the heat from the air and moves it somewhere else. Well, if the air coming across the coils is flying across the coils, then the refrigerant doesn't have the time it needs to absorb the heat and then pump it somewhere else. So the original heat pumps weren't very efficient. Air only moved across those coils at one speed. 
um, caused the electric resistance to be a very high usage, which caused electric rates to go up. Homes of the 70s, uh, the electric homes of the 70s, as a result, getting these really bad wraps. Today's heat pumps are variable speed, you know, low, medium, high, and then there's a turbo boost. And most systems, even if you use the turbo, come with an automatic timer that will turn that turbo off after a minute or two because it's not needed anymore. So the air moves across the refrigerant at a, a much slower pace. So there's less cycling of these units, turning on and turning off, turning on and turning off. They generally are set it and forget it type systems. Turn it on, leave it on, walk away, and they, and they use very little energy to condition the spaces um, that you're aiming to condition. So as we said, heat pumps are moving heat. They're taking heat from one place and moving it somewhere else. Generally, they're taking heat from a place we don't want it, if they're in air conditioning mode, and moving it outside a house so that the room inside is, is being cooled. So we're not using a flame to create heat and then moving that heat uh, via the use of fire and, and, and a fan. It's pulling heat out of the atmosphere already. And even at temperatures down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, there's still heat in that air that today's refrigerants can capture and pull out of that air and then move that heat maybe inside if you want it to be inside or it'll move it outside if you're air conditioning. But there's heat in everything. And so the refrigerants used in these systems are grabbing that heat and pumping it, moving it to somewhere else. That's where the pump comes from in heat pumps. Mike, I'm not on? sure if you, so, oh, hang on, Mike. I think, you, I'm not sure if you said the word minus, like as in below zero degree temperatures. Oh, yeah. They, it, it will move. If I didn't. There's heat. Yeah, there's heat in, in what we as humans perceive as unbelievably cold at below zero, below freezing temperatures. The physics of it is that there's lots of energy in that temperature still. And, and today's and refrigerants. So there's can plenty still of capture. energy, yeah, for the refrigerants to capture it and put heat inside your house. Yeah. So they work below freezing temperatures. So where are we using them? Uh, we're using them in pools. You can get large heat pump systems for heating swimming pools, and they're used throughout California, even here in San Luis. Uh, we're using them for our laundry. So heat pump dryers, um, sometimes called condensing dryers. So I find these systems to be um, part of that cohesive building system. When Jennifer talked about things being um, even more economical than a fossil fuel system, this is one of those aspects where installing a gas dryer into a home or, or retrofitting a gas dryer in a home is very difficult and time consuming and very laborious. Um, just the venting alone is the stuff that gives builders nightmares. It's always a thing that gets done at the end of a project. You grab the youngest person on the job, grab his ankles, hang him over the back of the dryer. And he's trying to reach down and tie all this <laughs> stuff together um, because you've got to vent everything, all your lint. You've got to vent all of that away from the flame that's being created inside your dryer. So condensing dryers, heat pump dryers don't work that way. They actually pull the moisture off of the clothing. So you're not putting your clothes into an oven and cooking them to dry them. You're actually just slowly pulling the moisture away from your clothing. Uh, so one of the knocks on heat pump dryers is people say, well, they take so long. We don't want to, we don't want to wait that long. Heat pump dryers today take on average about what it used to take a couple of years ago to dry clothes on a normal dry cycle. So 45 minutes, 50 minutes for a load of laundry. Somehow we've gotten into a, a notion of, you know, 20 minutes to dry seven cubic feet worth of clothing has become standard and anything longer than that makes us impatient. But about 45 to 50 minutes for a seven cubic foot load of laundry is what a, a heat pump can dry your clothes. Um, electric cars use heat pumps for heating and cooling in their cars. And this has to do with uh, conservation of energy and range anxiety. 
So conserving as much energy as possible so that the batteries in the cars have longer ranges is uh, tantamount to electric cars being successful and getting rid of that range anxiety. The, the big push on electric cars is always which one has the, the longer range. And heat pumps, because they're so efficient and use so little energy, are used in our electric cars for heating and cooling versus resistance coils, which used to be used. Uh, we use heat pumps for hot water. So there are generally uh, four different systems we see in the US. Um, we'll go a little bit in depth into one slide in depth on it, but um, Ream makes a very popular system that's available, I believe at Home Depot, whereas AO Smith makes another system that I think is available at Lowe's. I think those are the two companies that have those two brands. Um, these are called integrated systems. And then Sandin, who has suppliers in New York and Seattle, and hopefully we're gonna have one in Salinas in the next year or two in California. I believe that's still in the works. They make um, a split system, so a non-integrated system. And then this larger one, Space Pack, we've seen that get specced into large buildings for the use uh, for use as radiant heat for radiant heat systems. So there are a few different places that we use heat pumps for our, for our hot water needs. These are examples of the integrated versus split systems. So this integrated system is not unlike a water tank that we're used to seeing that we commonly see in homes now. Uh, it's a little bit taller, depending on the tank, the tank size that you get there, 50 gallon tanks, 80 gallon tanks, 120 gallon tanks. Um, but it's a one tank system, all in one, all in one shopping. This is a picture of the sand in system where the tank holding the water is inside the building and the heat pump, the condenser is in a different location outside the building. Uh, there's a pretty significant cost difference between these two systems. Uh, I've found the reams, you could be around $2,000, whereas a sand in, the last one we installed was, by the time we got over all of the um, supply chain snafus, it was about five grand to get the sand in into the home that we installed it in. So pretty significant, not significant in the whole big picture of the home, um, but if you're comparing the two, a significant difference. Mike, can I jump in with a couple yep. of questions? We did have... Sure. Um, Karen asked about um, electric options for replacement of a tankless hot water heater. And so obviously we're at the hot water section, uh, the hot water heat pumps um, of our presentation. So um, simply, yeah, there are electric um, options for replacement. There's also a question regarding um, refrigerants. Um, and do these heat pumps, because they use refrigerant cycles, um, have similar issues um, with CFCs and HFCs that maybe we encountered in the past? Well, Jennifer and I will both have answers to those. So um, you answered the first one. Yes, there are replacements. And um, the replacements are common enough that the guys from this old house have done a full episode on just replacing um, a typical gas tanked heat system with a heat pump system, like a one-for-one -one transfer. So they have a, if those guys are doing it, just about anybody can do it. Um, and if you have a plumber who says they can't do it, you can show them a YouTube video that's 20 minutes long and teach him how to do it. Um, and they have actually, they have multiple, this old house has multiple videos of the heat pump, of different heat pump water heaters going in as, as replacements. And, and so yeah. one thing to note, if I could jump in, is that if you are replacing a tankless water heater, which is often installed on the outside of a building for the venting, these units, maybe you could speak a little bit to placement of these units and the venting needs. Um, we can speak to that. We probably don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because we do Quickly. have a whole workshop on that, but um, they can be installed uh, in many places inside. They can be vented outside so as to not affect the indoor temperature. And they can also be installed in a closet outside a house with a louvered door, as long as they have access to um, the cubic footage volume of air that they require to operate efficiently. We have a few friends in town who have done exactly that, taken their, their instant, instant 
gas hot water heater off the side of the house and just built a little closet in that space on the outside of their house with a big louvered door and then covered the covered the hot water tank. Um, to the refrigerants, yes, they do use refrigerants. And yes, refrigerants are a problem if we're looking at our big carbon footprint uh, globally. That's one of the reasons why we use the sandin as often as we can, because even though it does use it has a very, very small amount of refrigerant that gets used in that process or in its cycling process, whereas the other ones might have um, larger loops of refrigerants. Jennifer can deep okay, dive into Yeah, this is where so. I'm going to jump in. Because <laughs> on the heat pump water heaters, the amount of refrigerant is very small because um, you, the whole, that whole unit that sits on top of the tanks like everything you need with the refrigerant is happening right there at the top. So, so that's one thing going for it. The sandin uses CO2 as the refrigerant. So it's considered to be neutral as far as a greenhouse gas or you know emissions in the refrigerant, as far as like where it ranks. Um, there's a movement now for a lot of the refrigerants in the heat pumps for space heating and for hot water to score better than the refrigerants we were using just like five years ago. And so in California and even the federal level, there's we've had the next kind of leveling up on using better refrigerants. And what I'm seeing now on some of the heat pumps for space heating when I'm looking at those specs, is I'm seeing that the companies are offering like the same unit, but with the option of a better refrigerant that doesn't have as doesn't rate as high on the global warming scale. And so they're they're putting it out there to kind of prime the market before they'll be required to switch completely over. So. Mike's right. That's like the thing that's got to be dealt with, but at least like on these heat pump water heaters, the amount is small and it's self-contained and there's no need for your plumber to connect refrigerant lines or to charge them or drain them or to do any of that. So as long as you don't puncture your unit, you shouldn't be leaking uh, the refrigerant. So make sure your finished carpenters are not putting finished nails where they're uh, unwanted. Oh, and then I see there's a quick question about earthquake strapping. Um, that picture of the ream, the, I think it, the straps were like airbrushed out, but you can see them, they're on the sand and they're on the AO Smith. Yes, in California, you still have to have those earthquake straps. It's necessary for California. Um, and again, we teach an entire workshop just on heat pump water heaters. Uh, so we could talk about these uh, for an hour and we often do. Um, so now we're gonna move to a space conditioning and, and do a few slides on uh, how we use heat pumps for heating and cooling and where we use them. So there are generally three types of systems, a, a ducted and again, broad brush stroke ducted, ductless, and what we call a package system. And within the ductless, there are a few different varieties of what we call a ductless system. There's a wall mount, a ceiling mount, and this would be considered a floor mount. This is another version of a ceiling mount, which looks small in this photo, but actually is quite large. They're generally uh, two feet by two feet. So they're they're pretty big when they're up in your ceiling. They're a lot like a ceiling register in a tiled office space. Uh, but I have installed them in, you know, even small, small ranch homes here in Slow. And if done, if done right, they're pretty um, non-obtrusive. Um, so ducted heat pump systems. You can generally think of a ducted heat pump system as a one-for-one -one replacement with a gas forced air system. It operates in the same way along the same principles, but instead of using fossil fuel to create the heat, you're using heat pump, a heat pump and refrigerant to capture heat out of the atmosphere and move it somewhere else. So uh, 
in theory, if you have a ducted forced air unit inside your house, you could replace one for one um, your gas system with a heat pump system. Um, if the home is older and you're doing work on the home, the chances are pretty good that the ducts are not gonna be up to snuff. Uh, so you'd wanna change your ducts anyway. But in theory, because they operate uh, along the same idea, you could change one for one um, the source of the heat in a ducted system. So you'd have a, a, a heat pump in your basement or in a mechanical room, and then your larger ducts running throughout your commercial space or throughout your residence. And these are the size ducts that require, you know, chases, uh, soffits, uh, closets being built so that you can run this ducting from a first floor to a second floor. So they're fairly large. There is also what we call a concealed duct system, which is sometimes called a ducted ductless system. Um, ask questions if we get too much into builder speak or arca speak here, but uh, in, a, in essence, you have, you have an outdoor condenser and then you have an indoor part that fits into, well, when we've done it, we've done it basically in a knee wall and put the, put the indoor section in the knee wall and then run short ducts to the places that are gonna be receiving the conditioned air. So it's ductless in the sense of where it moves the refrigerant from a condenser outside to your unit inside, but then the distribution of the air doesn't come from one single unit. It's ducted to a few different locations and, and the, you end up with wall registers or ceiling registers that will look exactly like our gas FAU systems that we know today. The system that we like to see used that I use the most in projects I build um, mostly for cost and uh, a very low labor costs and super easy and quick to install is what we call a ductless heat pump system. I, I think this is probably what gets um, associated with uh, a mini split heat pump, heat pump system the most. So what you end up with generally is a wall mounted unit, exactly like this one right here. This is a project I built. And this is, I think a one ton heat pump that, you, that was used to do two stories and another section of the house that you can't see in this photo. This house was built to the passive house standard back in New England though. But all we needed was that one ton ductless mini split system uh, to heat and condition this entire house. So I think our total heating and cooling cost for this house on installation was at that time, probably $3,500, maybe even a little bit less for that entire house. Um, you can take these wall units and try to hide them in some furniture. Someone else has pointed out before these little slats in that bookcase seem a little small. But I have also incorporated um, ductless wall mount systems into bookshelves. So I would build a, a big built-in unit on a wall, be surrounded by books, and then just one section, you know, 30 inches wide would have a heat pump installed in it and then still be surrounded by books. So you can get a little, a little uh, designy with the install, I'd say. And then there is a ceiling mount ductless system. So instead of having it mounted on your wall, this would mount on your ceiling. It's made to fit in between 16 on center. Um, it also can come with brackets. So if you're at two foot, you can work within a, a two foot on center space. But again, you'd have an indoor unit mounted in the ceiling and then an outdoor condenser. And that's all that you would have. So no ducting. Lastly, well, not entire lastly, but uh, just for the, for the big mainstays, uh, the cooking aspect, cooking without gas. So we are not talking about um, electric resistance cooking. The red coils of yesteryear, uh, we're talking about induction cooking. So induction cooking works with magnets. So we're not, we're not heating up this coil on top of our stove and then putting another material on top of it and waiting for that material to get warm, which then goes to our source that we're trying to cook. Uh, it's, a, it's a magnetic technology. So it goes directly to, it goes from the, desti from the source right to the destination. I think I intertwined those two words a second ago. 
but uh, highly efficient. So all of the energy used to make the heat is going right to the destination. Not all of it, but most of it. So very sleek uh, glass cooktops generally. And we put this wolf picture in there to let you know that, you know, wolf, Sub-Zero, Viking, all of these really high-end uh, companies, which, you know, if we're working in residential, uh, if we're building custom homes, a lot of the clients like to go that way. But even these companies are moving uh, towards induction cooktops as well. But Frigidaire makes them, LG makes them, uh, GE makes them, all in, all in budget lines. A couple quick images, and then we've got a video uh, to wrap up the cooking, the cooking without fossil fuels here. Uh, oftentimes when we work with clients, we hear them say, well, we like gas, we've just got more control over what we're doing. Um, we'll also hear that it's much, it's faster. And a lot of that comes down to marketing and there's no shortage of marketing behind anything related to fossil fuels. Uh, and I'm not anti-marketing, but it can be used in the right ways uh, for, the, for, for good versus bad. So um, speed doesn't play into account anymore and control doesn't play into account anymore either. You can see in these photos that the red is all of the heat and where it's going. So on a coil cooktop, most of the heat that's being generated is not going to the destination. On a gas, it's also still not going to the destination. It's moving around these pots. And, and with the gas, all of that methane is just pretty much going right up your nostrils as you stand over the stove and breathe it in. With an induction cooked up, the, the energy is going right from the source to the destination. So there's very little energy lost with an induction cooked up. So what does that translate to? generally translates to speed. So this is just a quick one minute video here. Mike, in each of these units are high-end units, even though it's electric and even though it's a gas burner. So it's not comparing a low-end unit to a high-end induction. I mean, these are all within the brand high-end and Electrolux puts this out to show their clients, you know, that comparison. I mean, it's almost laughable. Uh, and we have actually, I've used this video to work with um, a nuclear physicist um, in Southern California who insisted that he had more control over his cooking with his gas cooked up. It was just faster, he said. And we actually sat him down in a meeting and we played this video on the, on the shared screen on the wall. And Scott turned around and said, well, that's enough for me. And, you know, Ada's words, and uh, we are in the process of converting that house all electric uh, in San Diego right now. Uh, I actually have a live <laughs> real-time video of myself at a friend's house with their induction cooktop in Ventura, but we can't put it in our presentations because of the language in the background. But it is also <laughs> a, <laughs> a very quick uh, demonstration of how we um, made our coffee in the morning, so. So we, we spent a fair amount of time on the cooking side because it seems to be something that's like really, really important to a lot of our clients. And I also have a client who's um, engineer, same kind of story, but it's up, he's up in Campbell and he and his wife 
I just said, you know what, do your own research. They're, they're young enough that it's like, you, you have access to all the YouTube stuff, just go see. And so about two weeks later, he goes, yeah, I think we're going with the, um, you know, I think they went with Electrolux actually, but you know, they considered now the other brands too. Like after they watched the videos and went to the Bay Area and saw it for themselves, they were like, okay, now we see what you mean. And I've had clients who've been using induction for, um, you know, starting about 15 years ago. So, and a lot of professional chefs use it. Okay, this part of the process, oh, this Jennifer is, oh yeah, go ahead. We forgot to say, if any of you have watched the Great British Baking Show, which oh, right. pretty much everybody has through the course of the last two years, every single season, um, I mean, I've been watching it for two years and I was sitting with the kids the other night watching it and all of a sudden I went, oh my God, all this entire series is done with induction cooktops. Yes. So all of the Great British Baking Show, they are using induction cooktops throughout that entire series. So if you think you can't use them, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And so, okay. And so now here's some, in terms of overall energy use, the stuff I'm going to cover next, I'm going to spend only a small amount of time on it, but it impacts your overall energy use profusely, but it's really nuanced, really detailed. The cooking overall, maybe your energy impact isn't so huge in the big picture, cooking with gas. It's just that often that one small energy use appliance will get the, the proverbial, you know, tail wagging the dog and kind of undermine your effort if you're in this building sort of trade, um, undermine any effort you were helping your clients go fossil free and they were totally on board and then we get to the cooking and then it's like, er, it breaks and then all of a sudden they, it's a barrier. And yet, you know, the actual impact on energy use isn't that great. But if you could eliminate the fossil fuel, you could save tens, tens of thousands of dollars by not having to bring gas to your project just for cooking. So that's why we spend a fair amount of time on it. Now, when it comes to the whole building, our building codes are better, our windows are better, we have better insulation, and we have better ways of bringing fresh air into the building. And Real quick on the code, we kind of hit on it earlier. Uh, Mike, you could move the slide deck forward. We've got California marching through the energy code, through the building code, through uh, renewable electric generation goals. And we're heading towards our carbon free future. And part of that is the transportation sector. It's also part of the agriculture sector. So California is moving forward that way. Now, when it comes to actual buildings, if you are doing a, you can advance the slide. Um, if you're doing new construction, you're going to have better windows available to you just because that's where the California Energy code is, that's where the market is for high quality windows. Now you could get triple paned windows, you could get better windows that are more um, kind of what you might see in Europe or on the East Coast or in Canada where it was colder. Those products are now becoming readily available in California. So it just helps improve you, the comfort and you're not paying a premium for those types of windows anymore. So I just want to point that out. It's also better systems for high-rise residential projects as well. Um, and right now, you can probably get some of these really efficient American-made triple-pane windows at half the lead time of uh, some of your actual standard windows. There are some great American manufacturers making really good windows that are available you know, quite quickly right now. Yeah, that's right. And when we talk to the electric kind of a fo fossil free house and buildings, we want a good, we want good windows. We want good wall assemblies. We want to talk to our clients about controlling sun and sun angles and 
blocking out the heat when we don't want it, but allowing the heat to come in when we do want it. And like Mike has pointed out, we have an in, we have an entire class. I think it's online now uh, on demand that you can watch. That's just about kind of glass and window and shading options. So I, as architects and as builders, I think we should be mindful of this. And as a homeowner, ask your architect to look into this, to make sure that you're getting the sun when you need it and not having the sun and extra heat when you don't need it. When it comes to better wall assemblies, we are moving towards in new construction. Oh, that's a great. <laughs> okay, well, we're a little short on time, but uh, real quick, that thermal image, that, that feature that Mike was pointing at the window, we had really hot day and the temperature, even after the sun moved away from the window, even after the temperature outside cooled off, that frame of that window was still 96 degrees. And so one of the things we're talking about with these higher performing windows are frames that are called thermally broken. That means they don't let that heat transfer from the outside into the house through the frame itself. So that frame is a much better, has much better performance. Okay, so, and then, then I, I did wanna let you know that we're right at about six o'clock um, okay. and we wanna have about 10 more slides. So we should, probably should work through those and make sure we leave time for questions. Yeah, okay. And part of this whole package is to look at better wall assemblies. And when I say wa better wall assemblies, you might be used to thinking of walls should have insulation within the cavity, within the studs. But with our passive house style homes or our higher performance homes, we, and part of the California Energy Code is we are putting an exterior insulation to stop thermal bridging. And then we're putting furring strips over that exterior insulation to allow your siding and even your stucco and any other material um, allow for vapor and water and moisture to escape. So it thermally improves the performance and it gives you a much better um, resiliency and longevity and durability, which is part of sustainability because it lets your houses last longer to build this way. Um, part of the whole package, oh yeah, this is a scale mock-up that just shows what that continuous exterior insulation looks like. And in this case, we like to use a, this particular board is a wood fiber board. So it has a low embodied energy and we're trying to move away from using foams or uh, plastics for the outside of our construction. And Mike, I think we could just move on to our, our next slide. When we have a very, uh, what's called a tight house, in other words, we've designed these walls and we could do the same philosophy for the roof and the floor. And we have these windows that are very energy efficient. That whole structure needs a way to bring in fresh outside air when there's no wildfires. So we've got fresh outside air we could bring into the space and we, do do that through some mechanical systems. Um, and there's a variety of them. Some of them are kind of all in one units that recess in the ceiling. Some of them like the Lunos up at the, the top middle picture and top right picture. Those are small fans, inline fans that that whole assembly actually fits within your wall and brings air outside and into the space, but preheats it a little bit before it comes in. So you don't dump just cold air straight in. And then like the Zender and Renson unit on the left, those are ducted systems that go throughout the house. But these ducts are really, really small. They're like three inches in diameter. And the fan um, 
runs at a low speed continuously. You can filter the air. You can turn it off if you need to, if there is fire, but otherwise you could just leave it running and it heat exchanges. In other words, the air coming in is tempered, so it's not too cold or not too hot. And it just provides fresh air throughout the whole space. And then those other heat pumps we talked about is what does the heating and cooling for the whole house. So the combination is very energy efficient and makes for very good air to breathe inside your house. And then the very last piece of the puzzle on an all electric is to introduce energy, electric energy from the grid or have your own system, have your own solar energy system. And the solar panels now in California, we're seeing them everywhere. Where um, you can, yeah, there you go. We Utility scale, we've got them commercial and industrial where a lot of folks are installing them in their parking lots, also shades the cars. We're seeing um, for our multifamily and hospitality projects, especially where they've got flat roofs on those commercial projects, and we can load the roof up with solar panels and, of course, private homes. And then depending on your architect, how they design those roofs in the first place, you can have panels that are more or less integrated with the roof structure, or if you have the property, you could do a ground mount system. In terms of space needed, We've got some rules of thumb. And for any of you that are online that want more information on this, contact me. But for those, but just kind of generally speaking, if you've got a 2000 square foot home, say in a Tascadero, we're talking like the code now, the energy code, you might need like eight panels for that house. And if you really want to take your house to what's called zero net energy, like all of the panels would produce all the electricity you need for your house, you might need to add another six to eight panels. And if you're going to put in an electric vehicle, depending on how far you drive, that could be another six to eight panels. So that kind of gives you an idea of like how many um, panels you would need. And these panels are about three and a half feet wide by about five feet long. Batteries take up a fair amount of space. They're heavy. They're very, very heavy. So they will be installed either on the ground on a concrete pad or like in your garage on your concrete floor. And to give you an idea of how much space you or your clients might need on the next slide, we mapped out kind of everything you might need for your battery backup system, your PV system, your electric EV charger, the special gateway you need to control it all and the inverters. It's kind of a lot to take in, but rule of thumb, if you as, as an architect, designer, developer, or homeowner, if you know you're gonna have about 10 feet wide by about six and a half feet tall of free space, like on a garage wall, you would have enough space to install everything you need for your solar electric EV charger panel backup system. You could go taller if you want and make it nearer. You can also install it like in the corner of a garage, five feet on one wall, five feet on the other wall. But that's about how much space you would need for this. And with that, I think that pretty much wraps it up, really the highlights of what goes into a uh, all electric fossil free home, better envelope, heat pumps, heat pumps, heat pumps, more heat pumps, induction, <laughs> PV, solar batteries, I mean, solar panels and battery backup if you want it. And you now with those five elements, you're on your way to uh, more resilient, lower carbon footprint, fossil free uh, home. You and with that, we're gonna, you know, gonna open it up to Mike for comments and questions. You might think like, well, why, why are we looking at, why, why are you showing us a wall assembly in an all electric home? 
um, why talk about that type of thing? But if you think of, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, recycling is great, reusing is great as well. But the, the very first thing we really have to do is reduce the amount of energy that our buildings use in the very first place. And those are things we can do through common practices that we're doing in construction already. So we're showing wall assemblies uh, to show that reducing the, the energy usage in the buildings is tantamount. And then all of the things we talked about pertaining to the all electric home come in and, and, and make up the usage uh, that way. But you can't be energy efficient without building an energy efficient building first. Uh, and then you, you want the uh, me mechanics and appliances to use um, as little energy as possible. So that's why we have things like the wall assembly in there, why we talk about insulation. We didn't even dive off the passive house cliff, but we should, and we do in a different workshop, but essentially that's where we're going. So. Yeah. And even with our even with our retrofit projects, the first thing we'll assess is where can we make big um, impacts on improving the energy performance of the house as a whole, and then we go through the systematic uh, process of replacing, say, the on-demand gas heater with a heat pump, or taking out the furnace with the cat cracked heat exchanger and replacing them with ductless heat pumps, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and questions? Actually, Jen and Mike, before we go to questions, I did want to give um, Itzel a chance to let people know uh, about other programs that are coming up, um, and then I'll bring everybody back. We do have a couple of questions lined up. Um, Itzel, do you want to tell us a little bit uh, maybe about yeah. some of the programs? Yeah, really quickly also, um, I'm going to launch a poll with four questions. It'd be really helpful if anyone on the call can take it. It really informs feedback and trainings we bring into, into the region. Um, so yeah, really quickly, there's um, AIA learning units available. So feel free to contact me. It's 1.25 credits. So if, if you're interested in that, feel free to contact me directly. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and go through the process of that. For people who are here on call today, um, I will be sending out a follow-up email with recordings and an additional survey where you could write in just any feedback you have for us and an upcoming course for just our last course for the end of the year for this calendar, we have one December 2nd, Efficient Cannabis Yields Tri-County Greenhouse Optimization. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that one, I'll go ahead and drop our website information here. So you could take a look at that description a bit more, but more trainings coming up for this, this new year. So looking forward to seeing more of you be you here and and thank you for joining today i'll pass it back on for for questions thank you it's all it's always so great um just to see what you guys are cooking up so glad to see something um in the works um i also did want to mention um we often have a slide but it looks like it didn't make it in the deck today that this presentation um is available for community groups um free of charge. Um, and so if you or anyone you know um, is a mem uh, associated with a group that might want to put on this presentation for that group, Rotary, you know, some kind of a community group, um, energy enthusiasts, remodelers, um, go ahead and contact us. I'm going to um, put my information in the chat as well. Um, you can contact me or Itzel. And we can um, get that set up. Um, it is meant to be a repeated session. And we are actively looking for folks that might have a ready-made audience. And we're happy to just schedule it for you and um, provide the program. With that said, Habitat Humanity would be great. Um, that's in the chat. With that, um, <laughs> I'm going to shift gears quickly. We do have two questions from, I believe her name is Chie, if I understood um, Mike's pronunciation. Uh, Chia, do you want to go ahead and just unmute yourself and you can ask your two questions if you remember them? Yes, thank you so much. My question has to do with advice on overall strategy for removing gas appliances and replacing them um, with electric ones for a rental property. So it's not my, it's not a place where I live, but I want to give the renters a good experience 
and try to keep the cost down. So that's question number one, the overall strategy advice for a longer term project where you would replace the appliance when they conk out. Second question follow up um, has to do specifically with the heat pump. And I recently got a quote for a mini split system and I was just shocked at how expensive it is. And I'm curious about what the pricing range is and whether or not the heat pump mini split is affected by the crazy supply chain stuff that's happening in construction and what do you foresee prices to be? Um, I can answer all of those questions. Um, and I'm sure Jennifer has a, her opinions as well. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll go first, if that's okay, Jennifer. Um, yeah, go for it. Chie, thanks for asking the questions. Uh, if people don't know, Chie has written a book about her, uh, conversion of an existing home to a passive house. Um, Midori House, I believe is the name of the book. It's in our office somewhere, but it's a, it's a great book for anybody who's thinking about doing a, a big renovation, a very energy efficient uh, renovation project that she did on her own. Uh, she contracted it herself. So anybody can do it. You don't have to be a, a quasi skilled contractor like myself. Um, Strategy for long-term replacement. You kind of answered the question uh, as you were asking it. The idea is to um, replace the systems as the old ones conk out. You know, it's funny, just last night, uh, our 10 year old, as we were driving around town said to me, you know, why doesn't everybody just get a Tesla? That would solve all the problems. And I said, well, Hank, that's a great idea, but not everybody is ready to just go spend 60 grand on a new car when our car is, just fine right now. It would be a, a bad um, economic move to run out and just buy a car because it's better right now and put our other one into, well, a landfill if it's a, if it's a gas hot water heater. Um, so like you said, as the existing systems reach their end of life, that's the strategy. Replace them as that end of life uh, comes near. Um, so mini splits in the cost. It's almost, um, it's, a, it's a great question, but it could almost give a, a, a bad connotation by having mini split be in there with cost because right now you could have cabinet knobs uh, in there with cost, um, hardwood flooring in there with cost, uh, sheet goods cost. So everything in construction right now in the world, but especially in construction is being socked um, by supply shortages. And it's just economics that says uh, the cost of those things will rise. So we just got a quote uh, last night for uh, a one and a half ton system for an existing house we are retrofitting. And that cost was $9,000, including labor. So parts and labor to put that in, but that's a system that will cover two stories in one house. Uh, normally, I would have expected that to be about $7,500, but there's an additional $1,500 in there that I didn't quite anticipate, and that's just because of supply shortages. So, so yeah, many splits are getting socked by the same stuff that everything is right now. I hope that answered the question, or at least started to. Yeah, the other thing I think to think about on um, when you're converting uh, an existing house is your... Um, if you're able to have kind of assessment on your electric panel and what all is going on with your electric service and um, how much space you might have in your panel, because each of these appliances will require the uh, electrician to come out. If you don't already have it set up, they're going to need to put in a dedicated circuit for your heat pump water heater and that breaker box so it kind of shows in each of those pictures same thing with your outdoor heat pump unit for your space heating and cooling and um i've had some clients who did a whole bunch of work without really planning it out and then when i when they've contacted me for advice we've gone out we looked at their panels like oh 
when you have this work done, they just added this in here and they took up the space in your panel. Oh, are you still using that um, electric jacuzzi tub that sits in the backyard filled with leaves? No, okay, good. We're gonna take that out and we're gonna use that part of your panel. You know, So there's some of those things in older houses you have to consider. Um, in new construction, it's really easy to accommodate all those things. So that, that would be the only other thing I'd say is when you're looking at it, if you're gonna replace it as a conks out, you might just also have a plan on how you're gonna deal with your electric upgrades as needed. And, and real quick, I, we this is something that we forget to say or to really harp on a lot because we do these uh, workshops and we have these conversations so often that that $9,000 price for our renovation project that we're doing it's an oceanfront home in Cayucas. It requires heating and cooling. And that $9,000 is giving us heating as well as uh, cooling in that same system. So we're getting heat and air conditioning in the same system. So a heat pump can work in reverse. It can provide heat. It can also work in reverse and provide cooling. So we're getting both of those in one system. So uh, hopefully that helps with it. Thank you. Yeah, Mike and, I, and we're running running a little bit long. And I just wanted to say we have time for one last question, if that's okay with you guys. Sure. Yeah, um, it's okay with us so, if you guys want to stick on. Um, David um, Swanson, you've got your hand up, but you've also typed your question. Did you want to go ahead and ask yourself, or would you like me to do it for you? Go I for it, Michelle. Yeah, the, the question is regarding um, induction um, cooktops um, in a range top style, um, by which um, David is explaining, he means that the knobs are vertical below the, the cooking surface in that they have kind of folded forward and you access them from the vertical surface in front. Are you guys familiar with induction cooktops of that style? I'm not sure exactly what he's asking about. Go to the, to remember the Electrolux video? I mean, all three of the units they showed in their uh, their high-end unit were all range style. They, oops, sorry. So I, just about every manufacturer that's, they're trying to get that certain look to kind of fill that niche of what people were thinking are high-end um gas appliance might look like so yes this wolf I mean, right here is a range style yeah and, they, they and do make them um, and they also do make the insert type and they make them um, separate so you can just get the range top with the hood uh, i mean knobs on front and the um, drawers beneath or you can order it all together so yes it, there's a variety and the brand, uh, the all the high end brands are offering several options now. Great, thank you, Mike and Jen. Um, I did want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, we went a few minutes over, um, and I and it looks like we've answered most of the questions in the chat. Um, if folks think of questions after we hang up, um, obviously you are welcome to contact us offline. Jennifer at InbalanceGreen.com, uh, Mike at InbalanceGreen.com, um, and it's El Torres. I put all those email addresses in the chat. Um, I just wanted to thank Itzel for joining us this evening from 3C Ren and helping us host this program. Um, we rely on you guys and, and are so pleased to be able to um, collaborate with you. And I wanted to thank everybody for joining us on um, a busy pre-holiday evening. I hope that you enjoyed the content um, and that you're able to move your projects forward um, towards an all-electric home. Um, that'll, that'll be it for this evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.